so, you know, I find that when I, when I have this opportunity to come up here, there's usually something that happens in my life, and this one's a little different. You know, as I've mentioned many times before, usually I get this message at 3.30 in the morning. God wakes me up, and he says, I've got something for you. He tends to flesh it up. He sends me up here with one simple rule. He says, don't mess it up. Uh, it's his message, and it's to come here. This one is entirely different. This one came to me in the middle of a movie theater. Uh, I'm just sitting there minding my own business, eating my wife's popcorn, and uh, all of a sudden God says to me in the middle, he says, why don't you talk about this? And I'm, I'm thinking like, really? I said, okay. So I'm going to talk more about how that kind of played in and how it came about, but uh, it's, a, it's really an indifferent uh, inspiration for me and hopefully for you as well. So tonight's message really is a message of family, Mother's Day and a message of family. Um, there's three parts to this. I want to start and talk a little bit more about moms, uh, continue with the tribute that we've got going there. And two, we'll start to explore this link between uh, the messages that pastor have been bringing for the last several weeks about us being in Christ and Christ being in us and moving to this next section of becoming a member of the family of Christ. We've had this focus on us. Now it's just time to start to focus a little bit on family. So all about tonight, the punchline, if somebody asks you a question, what did he talk about? The answer is family. All right, so that's what we're going to do. And then the last thing is, is that we're going to share a bit of a family story, uh, some of this that you've had, and then how that tied into the movie. Uh, but before we go any further, further, would you please join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the opportunity to celebrate moms all over the world. We just ask that... Uh, the prayers and the words that go out tonight would touch our moms, Lord, in a way that just remind them that they are so important to us and so important to, um, to their children. Lord, we give uh, this evening to you. We ask a blessing on those that, that couldn't be here, that have traveled. Uh, Lord, we just ask that the words that come out of my mouth be from you. And Lord, that they just be uh, a joyful noise unto the crowd. And we give that in your son's name. Amen. So part one, uh, just talking about moms a little bit. Everybody, as we've already indicated, has one. I'm going to have to move this, I think. And uh, this is probably pretty easy. You could just imagine uh, all the things that your mom has done for you. Um, first of all, they are our first love. They are our food. They are our protection. They are our everything. They are there from the moment right on through. Dads, we try, but as most of you are aware, that first month or two, we're pretty helpless. Um, the only thing that we're really good at that point is changing diapers, and uh, mom's got the rest of it. At some point, we get better, but boy, throughout the entire life of our kids, and I'm just looking at my kids uh, in particular, when my, when my wife talks to our kids, they have conversations they spend time on the phone, they talk. When dad gets on the phone, it's just grunts. You know, just this little bit of, uh, 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 a little bit goes on. But moms know what's going on. And if dads want to find out, they've got to ask mom. Because mom's got all the answers in there. I um, mean, I have two grandchildren now. I know we've talked about that, Jack and Charlie. Uh, which means that I have two new moms. My, my daughters are now... Uh, mothers, or my daughter-in-laws, I should say, are now mothers, and my sons are now dads. So I have a new role now, and that's being the grandfather. Uh, and, you know, people talk about how great it is to be a grandparent in your kids. I'm just having a blast watching my kids become parents. It's really just amazing just to watch them go. My oldest son, uh, this is one of my favorite things, he's finding out that fine is no longer an acceptable answer to anything. When his wife will say something, he'll go, it's fine. And she's looking at him like, nah, it used to be fine, but it's not anymore. Life has changed for these kids, and they're kind of figuring that out, and it's kind of fun to watch them do that. But moms, you know, you deserve this special day. Um, you are incredible, and I know we take you for granted, and that's shame on us. And I know I speak for everybody here, but I say we're sorry, and that you are the greatest. Uh, you know, people have been touching on Proverbs 31, and I just want to take one little piece out of here and share it with you. Um, I, I just thought that this section in the center here where it says, she gets up while it's still night. She provides food for her family and portions for a female. So that means she feeds everybody. She considers a field and buys it. It took me two weeks to buy a lawn tractor. She just considers it, and it's done. All right? 
Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. Our friends Jeremy and um, Melanie Schultz have two little girls. They call them princess warriors. And that's the message. That's the vision I see when I think about this is that, that moms that are just princess warriors as they go out. This is a vision of an incredible woman. And this is just a snapshot out of Proverbs 31 where it's entirely dedicated to the wife of noble character. Um, if you really want to give your mother or the mother of your children a special gift, read Proverbs 31 to her and insert her name every time it says she. You will be a superhero. Mothers, we thank you, we love you, and you make everything groovy. Let's give moms one more big round of applause. And of course, moms lead us into this transition to families. And again, this is a transition from the messages that Pastor was saying about our personal relationship with Christ. And for us, and then it's just this concept of family. When I first approached Pastor with the, uh, the, the message that I had tonight, he said, well, do you want to continue with anything in Romans 8? And I thought, nope, I could probably mess that up. Uh, but last week when he was preaching in chapter 8, verses 12 and 13, I peeked ahead and I found that the next sp- verse or spoke directly to the message that God has forgiven for me today, as he always does. So if you look at me, at the, uh, the, the next verse, this is Romans 8, 14. This would be the very next verse in the series that we, were, that we were just studying. It says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So if you just kind of take where we have gone, this transition from Christ being in us as a person, and he comes down, he's here, he has a relationship with us, dies as we mentioned before he's, he goes on and he comes back and he tells his disciples about this holy spirit and he starts to introduce this concept and he says this is now who is going to guide you as you go through you are going to become children of god right? i was his son you are his children he says you're going to be led by the the holy spirit and you're going to be that so this children thing starts to lead us into this whole idea and the Bible is filled with verses that sing a family and community and the power of being part of the church. So this is a big part of what I'd like to get across tonight is that you are the family. You are the family of the church. And at some point when we get done, you're going to be hugging each other and we're going to be singing Kumbaya. But the idea is, is that as a church, we become that family. The power of that family is evident in our ability to care for one another, to serve one another, teach and learn from one another, pray for one another, and the great commandment to love one another. In Galatians 6, 2, we're called to care for each other. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Matthew 8, 20, a very familiar passage, says, encourage us to get together and to pray. He says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there with you. Notice that in each of these verses, Christ is joining us in the mission. He hasn't just said, go and do this by yourself. He says, I'm going to be there. I'm going to make this. And he says, when we go from this relationship, this one-on-one relationship, when we take it into the family, I'm still there. I'm still encouraging you. I'm still, I'm going to still be part of that as we make that happen. So I wanted to start thinking about this belonging to the entire family. I've said this a couple times. But this last verse in John speaks about that love. And this is my life verse. And I I guess I couldn't do a message if I didn't put this up here. Greater love has no one than this that would lay down one's life for his friends. And this is perfect transition into um, the last part of this. And that's kind of our personal story. This is uh, uh, our, our personal uh, testimony, and uh, it's, it is meant to be shared to uh, express that love that the family of the church has for us and for our ability to give that back, and this encouragement of those who are sitting here tonight to know that everybody else in this church depends on you. And whether you ever re- realize that or not, or whether you ever have the opportunity to take advantage of that, it's there. And it's our responsibility as members of the church to join that family in that step. So as part of our story, 
I um, just want to share a little background. I said, when I was traveling Central Mis- Mission on, or Central America on mission teams, I was always awestruck by either the personal tragedy or the miracles or the testimonies of the people I met. I felt that these people truly had something that was worth sharing, something that captured the true essence of being saved by grace or what it was really like to experience a real intervention of some kind or a story of hardship that only a loving God could remedy. I can just remember one of my very, very first trips to Nicaragua. I can remember a young man coming in and telling, telling this story that I just couldn't believe. This is a, in, a, in a, a war-torn part of Nicaragua where he is laying face down in mud while guns are being fired over him. He'd already been shot, and he just all he could think of was, I just have to lay here perfectly still so that I'm not killed. And this battle continues over the top of him, and it's by the grace of God that he's saved. And I'm sitting there, my tears are pouring down my face, and I'm saying, my only testimony is I get a bad haircut once in a while. I mean, I have nothing compared to this. How could I ever stand up in front of somebody? But over time I found out that, that it doesn't matter who you are, Christ will use your story or some part of that story. And it is as important and it is, is as truly touching as some of these war-torn stories that we hear as well. So over time... I'm just going to share a little bit of this. This is our personal family terror story of pain and prayer, of suffering and hope, uh, and the true meaning and the power of family. Now, Sue tells this story much better than I do, but as timing would have it, she's in North Carolina celebrating our, grad- our daughter's graduation from her program, her fellows program today, uh, and she couldn't be here with us. But through the miracle of digital media, I'm bringing you Sue. Hey, happy Mother's Day. Sue Southwick here. I'm here to tell you about a story, our testimony. Many of you know it, but many of you don't. And if you don't mind, I might read my notes so that I don't cry. So here we go. Addie's story is a story of hope, fear, miracles, family, and redemption. Here's a small recap of our, of, of our story. 13 years ago, Addie slipped off the monkey bars and suffered a traumatic brain injury. She was rushed off to Rutland Regional Hospital to be stabilized, followed by a helicopter ride to Dartmouth-Hitchcock Hospital where they could treat her more effectively. As I watched the medical team attend to our nine-year-old daughter from the inside of the ER, I was waiting for Dave to come. I received a phone call from, guess who? Pastor Roland. Yep, Pastor Roland. He prayed with me and he said, we're coming. Over the next few hours, These are some of the fears and struggles that filled our lives. They informed us her lungs are more full with aspiration than has ever been seen before. We're watching her head to see what will happen with her brain. She was induced in a coma and intubated to help her breathe. She had emergency brain surgery, which lasted seven hours. Countless hours of prayers, calls, cards, visits, support. Day five, she was awakened. Still, many fears were ahead of us. Will she be able to breathe on her own? What has been damaged in her brain? Will she recover fully? As a matter of fact, one morning, the respiratory therapist said to all the doctors and nurses in a, meeting, in a morning meeting, Addie doesn't read from our textbooks. Her book is far higher. Fast forward to many days of testing and and healing day 12 it's time to check out we had our supports organized for her home for her uh, coming home and recovery many therapy appointments and then finally on the way out of the hospital in the in the elevator was a poster that said lobster fest august 17th addie sitting in her little wheelchair with her little neck brace said Lobster Fest, is that today? We said yes, and she said, let's go. So we joined the hospital staff and all who were there at a Lobster Fest on our way home. We stopped before we left to go visit the pilot in the helicopter pad. Addie actually got to get in the helicopter since she didn't remember her first ride. Um, We arrived home with friends who had cared for all our needs, the dog, the lawn, the house, the food, the love, 
the prayers. We were surrounded and saturated by love from our church community, our, our community in St. Albans, and listen, we needed every single bit of it. After six months at home doing rehab, she finally got to go back to school. We really want to tell you we are eternally grateful for all of you. We are a family. We are God's family. You want to call her and clap for her? <laughs> so I realize that for some of you that uh, may be the first time you've ever heard our story and... Uh, um, you would, you would think that that would be enough, that there would be, uh, you know, that, that's all we would have to say. But uh, remember how this message started, that it started out in a movie? I just want to add a little bit uh, to what Sue has already said and um, just kind of tell you how that God works in your lives sometimes and you just kind of least expect it. So Sue and I went to see the movie uh, Breakthrough. How many of you have seen, have seen the movie Breakthrough? So a couple out there. So I won't spoil the whole thing for everybody else. uh, But um, when Sue first told me about this movie, I really hadn't heard anything. And uh, she had seen some interviews on television, and um, she was telling me about it. And she thought, and she said, uh, well, it's a true story of a kid who falls through the ice, who's saved by his mom's praying, and then uh, Jesus gets the glory. I'm being a little crass. I'm being a little bit... uh, maybe sound uncaring on here, but I, as she was telling me the story, I could think, well, it sounds more like a documentary and, you know, maybe it's a 10-minute script. But when my wife says she wants to go to the movie, I want to go to the movie. So we're off to this movie. And um, this is where it gets personal because in the middle of this movie, Christ grabs me by the scruff of my hairy neck and he says, you are not the only family that has felt the presence of my love in the face of adversity. I thought, that's kind of interesting. He said, you're not the only family that is surrounded by prayer and have seen my miracles, and you're not the only family to have experienced the power of your church family when you needed the most. Thirteen years ago, I was with you just as I was with the family in this movie, The Smith Family, at their deepest time of need. He says, I want you to go out and tell your story about family, and about faith. Now, you've heard the details. Uh, you know, in the short period of time that Sue, Sue can, can tell you this, but all of a sudden as I'm watching, and we're watching this movie, it would be one thing to be crying for the family in the movie. That would be understandable. But I found myself crying for the fact that this movie is almost identical to Addie's story. Almost identical. Some of the stuff that happens in this movie is so spooky, similar, that it makes you cry. And this is where God is coming back to you and he says, see, I can do this over and over and over again. I'm I'm thankful that he did it for us, but as I'm watching this, I realize this is the God that we serve. He can reach out and he does this any time, any time he wants. Listen to these. For those of you who have seen the movie, this will make sense. For those of you that are going to go out and see it, I'll give you the notes. Addie Falls. The very first person to see this is an angel. This is a person that we don't find for two years. Same thing in the movie. Somebody sees this happen and they initiate 911. There is no hesitation between the moment that she hits the ground And the moment the call goes to 911, the first responders respond from a trauma unit. We're in Rutland, right at the base of Killington Ski Area. These people are trained for ski accidents. They know how to handle head trauma. They are rushed into this hospital who know that they can't take care of her long term, but they can take care of her and they stabilize her. They initiate the call to Dartmouth to bring the helicopter. And there's a helicopter ride, just like in the movie. I'm going to spoil this part of the movie for you. But when that helicopter lands and they come out, the pilot comes out, says to the mom, the mom's getting on, on, on the helicopter, says to the mom, I want you to know that this ride is not for you. It's for your child. If you get sick in my helicopter, you clean it up. And that's the same thing he said to Sue. Now, 
He also asked Sue. She's not behind me, is she? <laughs> also asked Sue how much she weighed. That's the first time my wife has ever had to tell somebody exactly how she weighed. In our particular case, the helicopter came over with a trainee. So there was one extra person on the helicopter on the way to uh, Rutland. And so when it came time for Sue to say that she was getting on that helicopter, the pilot said, well, there's no way you're getting on. I can't, I, I don't have a, I have a weight limit. And I have an extra person on this. Well, you all have met Sue. And Sue was not going to let that helicopter go anywhere without her on it. She didn't care if she got sick and had to clean it up. She didn't care if she had to tell him how much he weighed. But when he went back and recalculated, guess what? To the pound, there was room for Sue to get on that helicopter. This mom gets on the helicopter and she goes as well. Back to these similarities. Sue mentioned in here, things would get much worse before they would get better. The timing between when they thought Addie's lungs were going to clear and the same thing with this young man in the movie and when there might have to be surgery was critical. If, this, if the pressures in her, in her head changed one more, bit more, they were going to have to do surgery and if the lungs weren't ready, they weren't going to be able to do it. And the last time that they took the, the uh, uh, chest x-ray on her, they said, well, these are bad. We're not going to be able to do it here. And the bad news is, or the worst news is, that these lungs are going to get worse before they get better. When it came time, when the nurse in the, in the PICU said, we got to go, and he called the neurosurgeon, the uh, respiratory therapist came back and did a chest x-ray before they came in. There was nothing in her lungs. Nothing. And that's when somebody said, Addie's reading from a different book than we are. And the same thing in this young man's life. Just when they thought it couldn't get any worse, mom starts praying, everybody starts praying, and this thing starts to clear up. Seven-hour surgery and the long but successful recovery. And one thing I left out of my notes, and I don't think that Sue said, but the same thing happened in this movie, is the boys returned to his church. As some of you may remember, but we wheeled Addie in right to this corner, and she got up and danced with some big old fat dad right here to the music of our worship team. And that was her return to her family and her church. Same thing in this movie. So I'm watching the movie, and I'm saying, yeah, but... Did I didn't need to be reminded of this whole thing? I mean, I live this all the time. I went through a period where I would wake up in nightmares, and it was only by the grace of prayer at a men's retreat that I was finally healed of that. I don't have those recurring things. Of course, we think about it. But now we think about, you know, what God has planned for Addie. That message of family and that plan for her. God has plans for her. Same thing that they said about the boy in this movie. God has plans for them. And so we started to think about that, and we started to celebrate it. So I said, okay, well, what is it you want? And I'm just going to read this. He says, you need to be reminded that not only did Pastor and Suzanne say they were on their way, they drove down in the middle of the night, they slept in their car because there was no room in the inn, and they were at Addie's bedside at the break of dawn the very first morning. And that was just one of many, many trips that they made back and forth to take care of one person in that family. He said, you need to be reminded that people at work come for you for two solid weeks and that your sister-in-law set up a voicemail message that gave every caller a daily update. You need to be reminded that your church family took care of your house, as Sue said, your lawn and your pets every day while you were away without having to ask. They even bought us new towels doesn't speak for the old towels, does it? <laughs> you need to be reminded that the prayer teams filled the waiting room daily. And every day when we were out, there were new people in that, in that waiting room praying. Every day, there was somebody there. And there were others that were praying 24 hours a day around the world. I don't have this in my notes, but she's sitting right there. But I don't have to remind you that the kings came and took Kit, who was bored to tears, trying to be a good brother, and took him camping. And they changed their camping plans and camped camp just a short distance away so that, uh, that he could be there at, the, at, the, uh, uh, at any need. 
I don't need to remind you of the tears of joy you cried when your little girl came out of her coma, squeezed your hands, and gave you that beautiful crooked smile through those tubes and bandages. And those of you, I'm going to spoil this part, those of you who have seen the movie, he squeezes, say yeah. So I'm sitting in this movie going like, okay, I, I get it, I get it. He's not done. He says, you don't, you don't need me reminded that the doctors and nurses work so hard to keep your little girl alive. They were in awe and told me personally, we are in awe of the power of prayer and support that your church family has showed. We need more of that in this area. I don't mean... Don't need to be reminded that God saved Daddy's life that day because he had unfinished business in her life. She had to tell her story. Come part of his Young Life ministry. Study under his fellows program, which she graduated from at 3 o'clock this afternoon. And she's in time to celebrate Mother's Day once again with her mom and her grandmother. So I don't have to remind you of the great things that she's going to do. And finally, he says, I don't have to remind you that there is no way you could have ever endured this tragedy without the help of your church family. And I know that's true. My personal testimony is that I can't imagine anybody going through anything similar to this without the power of God and the power of family. Without that hope, without that faith, without people around you who were praying nonstop. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. Because the love poured out. I mean, I heard from people all over the world who were praying for her. And those prayers were heard. As the verses say, as we've read, they said, they carried your burden. They gathered in his name to pray. And they laid down their lives for you. When you read the verse, it says, no greater love than the person who would lay down their life for a friend. The easiest thing to think is that this person would stand in front of a bullet, as a young man did in Colorado. But often, kind of, uh, the analogy is, is that, would I lay down my cell phone to spend a couple minutes with my child? Would I lay aside a couple minutes of the day, of my work day, to have coffee with a friend? Would I lay down a day of my life to travel to Dartmouth to see a young lady? Is to take a small portion and lay it aside for someone else. That's the sign of love. So I ask today, do you have a church family? And I believe that when we talk about a church family, it is more than just coming to church on Saturday night or Sunday morning. I thought about that and I said, well, if I were a dad who only showed up for breakfast on Sunday, what kind of a family would that be? We have church ministries, we have outreach, we have things that go on all the time. And I encourage you to get involved with those things. Make this your family. Make this something that is more than an hour a week that you have that opportunity to serve others in the church. Look around. We have Martha's Kitchen. We have Samaritan's House. We have all kinds of, of ministries that are available for you, and I just encourage you to be part of that. And if you're not a member of a church, I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to investigate it, find a church home. If this could be your home. We'd love to have you. But I encourage you to come forward. As I call the worship team, if you wouldn't mind coming back up, please. You guys know Kumbaya. So as they're, as they're going through, let's just take a look at just some finishing verses. And I think that this is really where we start to see our, ourselves being called. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. In 1 Peter 4, 8 through 10, and above all, love each other deeply because... Love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. 
Each of you should use whatever gifts you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. I love the concept of stewardship. We're given a responsibility and we have to be good. Is that what you were talking about? Is that me? <laughs> I'm so close to the end. <laughs> and of course, in Joshua 24, 15, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If I could have the prayer team come forward as well. If you have a need for prayer, please come down and let our team pray for you. And if you're not part of a church family, as I mentioned, I'd welcome you to meet with Pastor Roland or any member of the church staff and let them fill you on what it means to be a member of Church of the Rock. Amen.